and this is the Convergence Forum, and we're bringing together Kara in the UK, myself in Montreal of the Jewish uh, Socialist Bund, Andrew, uh, a Bundist in Tennessee, of all <laughs> places. <laughs> the last place in the world you would expect the Bundist to live is Tennessee. What's happening Actually, in Tennessee, Michigan, Andrew? Michigan. Hey, your, your, your microphone is not the. Uh, I'm through. originally from Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Come closer to your microphone. We want to hear you more. Okay. Yeah. Flint, Michigan, I remember it used to be a big uh, car manufacturing town and, as well as Detroit. But Flint, Michigan was where the factories were and where the workers were. And then it all collapsed. It used to be a, you know, uh, sort of a big industrial hub and sort of, you know, rich workers, aristocracy of labor and all that. But now I don't think it's much of anything. By the time I left, the uh, water was so full of lead that a lot of my family was getting sick. Wow. Uh-huh. That's like 50s uh, era, 1950s, way back. That's underdeveloped. The United States is underdeveloped. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, it's underdeveloping. Even back, even yeah. back then, lead pipes were considered really dangerous. They did the experiments. They knew it would be dangerous when they tested yeah. lead pipes. And because, uh, God, lead pipes are old. They go quite a bit back because they're easy to make. Lead's a very easy material to work with as like a constructive material. Yeah. Problem is, is while it's sturdy, as soon as it breaks, it becomes incredibly toxic. And so once that pipe flakes, which lead eventually does, it just starts bleeding it into the pipes. And yeah. because they weren't maintaining them properly, because if you maintain them properly, technically speaking, yeah. they'll stay fine. But because they weren't, they went bad. You should not be using lead pipes for fucking input water. You shouldn't be using them for output water either, but they, they allow that still in the US. They'll use wow. drainage pipes of lead still. Fucking wow. wild. Like, yeah. But they knew when the, the, when the capitalists implement these kind of things, they do a lot of rigorous testing. They knew as, in the 20s when asbestos became the norm for, uh, I think it's the 1910s actually, the norm for insulation. Yeah. They did tests in the 1900s. And they found out that it was dangerous. They found yeah. out it was horribly dangerous. It'd fuck your lungs up. It'd kill you. And they still yes. put it in everyone's buildings for, yes. what was it? Was it the 70s when they started going against asbestos? I can't remember. It was, no, it would be the 80s, actually. So um, 19 fucking 80s, 90s yeah. was when they started dealing with the asbestos problem. This, they knew it. They uh, knew my dad's house dangerous. still has asbestos tiles yeah. uh, on the kitchen floor. The brown asbestos tiles is sticking your home. Yeah, they knew that the lead was poisonous, you know, because of the uh, the uh, uh, explorations of the uh, of the sailors who went through the Northwest Passage. You know, they took their food in uh, in, in lead uh, cans, you know, preserved in lead cans, and they died. You know, like during the voyage, you know, because all their food, you know, was so polluted. You know, I mean, like lead. You know, if you touch it, you know, perhaps it's got a small layer, molecular layer of lead oxide, you know, on the surface, but inside, you know, it's uh, it is, you know, like very uh, toxic. I remember and, uh, about a year ago. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> so you moved from uh, Flint, Michigan to Tennessee. Yes. Why? <laughs> Why? Lower taxes. Uh, uh, wow. It's got to yeah. be the most American thing I've ever heard you say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lower taxes. I'm sorry. And lower lower <laughs> ser services as well. So it has okay. worse public transport too. <laughs> it is America. Tennessee is America. To be uh, fair, my mom and I moved with my grandparents. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. So you were kind of like dragged along because you kind of had to be. Yeah. So how did you fare in school, you know, with all the uh, Nazis uh, walking about? Well, originally, like, I was kind of a centrist, you know, like, I was on the fence on what I considered myself politically, but then around the time after Syria got bombed when Donald Trump was elected, I became somewhat of an anti-imperialist. Mm -hmm. Then I saw what, you know, Barack Obama, when he went to Flint, Michigan, and did that performative stunt, uh, drinking only a sip of the lead water, 
and putting the rest out. I saw what a I saw what a fake he was, you know. Mm-hmm. Barack Obama is kind of a wild person for me because he came in in like 2008, so around the time I was 10. So I I had already become a fascist by that point, and like even though this was before I had had my racism problem shunted. I never really had an issue with black people. It was mainly anti-Semitism that I had a problem with. And then um, I think some anti-Islam stuff too. But re- that aside, I um, I never really had an issue with them at first. I, I actually kind of got caught up in the Obama wind, which is weird. As someone who's like a child Nazi becoming an Obama supporter in England. And that actually, like, uh, when I got into wanting to join the military... That actually got me caught up in wanting to get involved in like American based stuff. Like I I was fucked. Like, it was a kind of crazy time. But then Obama was also the person who like blew shit up for me because when I took acid and had my brain like fucking scrambled and I had to like build up my conceptions of things again. I looked at what the drone strikes were. I looked at the Syrian crisis. Um, I, 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 I fucking how everyone had just forgotten that fucking like uh, Islamic State had a lot of ties to the rebels in fucking Libya and shit like that was mm, yeah. burning in my brain. And so Obama was also the guy who created such a virulent hate for America and me. It's unreal. Mm. And uh, then there was like the election afterwards. What we got was World War Three or Donald Trump. Like, what a weird fucking t- situation and, and decision to put people in. Hmm. Like, fucking Hillary Clinton. You know, I would have probably been fucking better if she won, if she wasn't going to start World War Three. That was the crazy thing. She was like, no fly zone over Syria. And it's like, what, you're going to shoot down a Russian plane? After they told you they're not going to listen to you, no fly zone, you're going to start a war. Hmm. I remember ah. all these, uh, She probably ahead. didn't even figure that out, you know, before she mouthed off. Yeah. I remember all these American liberals calling her the hill dog, you know, and things the like hill that. dog. <laughs> oh my God. This is the like Biden thing where he's like, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, Biden was a black guy and Hillary's from the hood. Like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? Like, my guy wants to be fucking squealing. Like, what? <laughs> America, America is there. But uh, it cannot be, you know, like America cannot be, you know, it's it's blown its cover, you know, it is no longer the bastion of democracy that it claims to be. And uh, I don't think Kansa it ever has was. exposed them uh, for, for being the fascist regime that it is. It's Kansa. always been fascist. Yeah. I mean, that so that is not necessarily true. The U.S., does always have fascism going on but Mm. most capitalist systems do any system that has a police force has an element of fascism going on because no matter how liberal a government is a police force is fascist police don't act like liberals they act like fascists fascists will sometimes talk to you they don't always just crack your skull open but you give them the choice of the two in a tense situation they're probably gonna crack your skull open you know it's that kind of framework but what, what we got to understand is that the government itself can be liberal while those things exist as institutionally fascist sure. things. Yeah. The last 30 years has been this weird struggle because neoliberalism rose up and neoliberalism was meant to be a return to liberalism in replacement of the social to outright fascism that America kept tiptoeing between and same with the British throughout the Cold War. Margaret Thatcher to, uh, I was about to call him Tony Blair, fucking uh, Ronald Reagan, the <laughs> same guy. Uh, that's why he lost his memories. He just disappeared into, into heaven. He became Tony Blair to rule the British Empire. But uh, Ronald Reagan law aside, um, wait, isn't he also Margaret Thatcher at the same time? This, this is getting deep. Uh, those two brought liberalism back as a way, well, their attempt to, was as a way to try and like, Laissez faire up the system. And in many ways, they achieved that. The bourgeoisie have been rubbing us blind more than they ever have before since their arisal, trickle down economics, all that bullshit. That is very liberal. At the same time, not only did they incorporate elements of fascism, quite a lot of it into their thing, they didn't manage to get rid of a lot of things they wanted to get rid of because of how unstable the return to liberalism is. This is the thing that um, I think Stalin talked about 
that like a true return to liberalism for capitalism is like impossible after World War II. Um, like uh, World War One already spurred on a lot of this problem, and so like they could be liberalism in like character for sure, but liberalism in like entity and actual physical form doesn't end up playing out so well because there's so many variables that capitalism has created for itself. Laissez-faire becomes way too unstable. And we've seen that what every six to seven years without failure, there's been a fucking crash. Like during the cold war, when they were like really heavily managing the economy, it was about every 10, maybe 13 years. So like there is a there is a difference there that is actually very drastic by capitalist standards. And uh, what we so what we see is America in the last 30 years has been having a competition between neoliberals, neo-social Democrats, social Democrats and fascists. Now, neo-social Democrats is kind of the weird shit, the fucking like uh, the 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 the. The, the Lib Dems have been advertising themselves as they're not actually proper social democrats. That's why I mentioned social democrats separately. Neo social democrats or third wayists. Um, the the third way is like, what if we mixed a bit of neoliberalism, a bit of social democracy, a bit of fascism, a bit of this, a bit of that, make this hodgepodge idea that doesn't fucking work, that is schizophrenic and changes a lot. And what it's trying to do is imitate what China's fascist government does in the way that they switch between liberalism and controlled economics. But they're not actually doing the controlled economics the social democracy would normally enforce. Because they, uh, as as the inventor of the third way said, Anthony Giddens, they, uh, Tony Blair has quote inserted too much of neo of neoliberalism into the third way end quote, um, and uh, you know the corporatist element has kind of disintegrated from it. So this whole framework has created this kind of vast ideology. The social democrats, so a few of them cucked themselves to the Dems, and you saw how they failed. They got crippled by that bullshit. Some of them have gone their own way and tried to form different parties and have ended up either with dodgy characters or with decent characters. It's usually a bit of a mixed bag. you got the Green Party, other groups like that. They're still trying to vie for that social democratic position in regards to the competition for power. The fascists are either utilizing the Republican Party, the Libertarian Party, or they are not involved in governmental elections and are doing their own underground stuff and are relying on the Republican Party to fulfill their needs, to destabilize sure power in the system so they can rise out of the out of the ground. America's equivalent to National Front. I can't remember the fucking name of it. but uh, What, sorry? Patriot Front. There you go. The, the, what is, uh, what the, are they um, doing? Uh, uh, is there some opposition organizing against the Patriots Front in, in your area, or, or do they have free reign? Do they control the... Uh... Well, they pretty much have free reign as, as well as the other fascists in my area. Hmm. Um, what's the, the other one? It's called like the Aryan something. And all that? Aryan Brotherhood or Aryan That's Nation? That's the one. Aryan Brotherhood them as well aryan brotherhood is training in prisons right now training masses of people they have got armies of men waiting to get out of those jail gates waiting we're talking murderers we're talking bandits we're talking all sorts of people who have been like they already know how to kill and anyone who's been in that situation can be rehabilitated but these people instead have been taken the opposite way their bad elements have been turned into characters of themselves, you know, and they have had to fought, fit into that caricature. So yes. in a prison context, that can be done quite easily because, you know, <clears throat> you know, they just present themselves as rebels against authority. Well, yeah. And what's it? Because they're right wingers. They don't get hit as much. You'd be a black yeah. group. And you uh, start training and organizing like that. The police are going to start kicking the shit out of you. Oh, yeah. They'll terrorize you. Yeah, solitary confinement. Aryan Brotherhood will actually collaborate with the prison guards sometimes. Like they'll fight against them too, but it's yeah. kind of like the way the big bourgeoisie. Um, on one, it's kind of weird with the lumpen bourgeoisie. They're not necessarily the big big bourgeoisie, but a lot of lumpen petty bourgeois and bourgeois end up in the same prisons you're in a lot of the time. They're not the normal bourgeoisie. You don't get the same kind of protections. So what ends up happening is class structure 
takes its place. These people have a lot of money on the outside, so they have a lot of power on the inside. And so what ends up happening is these people rule the roost. You know, the gods will have meetings with them to understand, okay, are there riots coming? Like, what's going on on the beat? Who's doing what? What's going on? And there'll be regular meetings going on with these big cats. I actually met a guy. Um, he actually robbed me at knife point eventually, but uh, we um, spoke about a time where he was in prison and he actually sat in on a dealing with, like, we're talking big boys in prison, talking with the guards. So, like, this is a whole sort of framework. The class structure mm -hmm. in prison is indignant. So these groups have a role in trying to keep down other groups. So to the police, so long as they're not fighting them, which definitely does happen, um, and they're fighting also the people they're targeting because their main target is race war. They want to fight against the color the colonized peoples in these prisons. Then so what, uh, the, uh, what ends up? What ends up? Okay, uh, Andrew. Andrew. Can I finish my? Can I finish my finish, sentence? You know, but we, what we ends up? What Andrew. ends up? What ends up happening is they are used as a tool to keep the prisons under control. Yeah, yeah. You remind me of uh, when I was in prison. I have many incidents that I can think of. But uh, what we need to uh, record here is what is happening in Tennessee. This is indicative of the whole USA. You know, the patriotic front there that you're talking about, <clears throat> have they done anything recently? And is there any opposition? They recently uh, took to the streets of Nashville again about two weeks ago. Within... They took to the streets of Nashville, Tennessee, about a couple weeks ago, with little to no opposition whatsoever. What opposition was there? What the what's the little opposition you refer to? Just good bystanders for the most part. No activists, really. Uh huh. Yeah. And the police were they there? Yeah, they were basically letting them through. Letting them through into what? To the. Like the state capital. State capital? <laughs> they yeah, went they into were the, the state capital? They didn't go into the state capital, but they were gathering outside of it. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. Wow. National, uh, sorry, Patriotic Front as well. They they actually exist across the U.S. They're not as big as they used to be. They're kind of old boys. Um, they're tied to biker groups. Um, I think Hell's Angels has like old school ties with Patriot Front, and there might be a few other groups. But um, what's it? Uh, Aryan Brotherhood are kind of the new big boys that kind of been taken over a lot of the scene, but they have more dominance in prisons than they do outside. While Patriot Front still has their little fleeting existence outside because they're a little more careful these days. They kind of like the British Nationalist Party and like um, not the EDL right now, but when the EDL dies down and they start trying to act like, oh, no, we do nothing wrong here. You know, and Tommy Robinson is the new and improved, all that bullshit that happened in the 2010s. Hmm. So they try to act like. One okay, thing I, I will say as someone who's part Irish is that I think it's very erroneous that the Aryan Brotherhood uses a Four leaf or three leaf clover, you know, as their symbol with a swatch to go over it. Wow. So they are they trying to say that they're Irish by origin or something? Something to that effect. See, that would be a bit weird, isn't it? Yes. Because aren't they like patriotic for America? Like, what does their patriotism even mean at that point? Let me get this symbol up. Because if it's a four leaf clover, that would be funny because they're like, that's like a like obvious fake Irish people moment. Yeah, because, yeah. <laughs> the it's Irish so symbol is a three leaf shamrock three for those leaf, that yeah. might be wondering. Yeah, I, I remember you saying that. Yeah. Yes, Andrew. Oh, their symbol is a three leaf clover with a swastika over it. Ah, oh, three leaf. Okay. So they're trying to be authentic. <clears throat> it's not the symbol they use now. Okay. Okay, so the symbol they but... use now is like uh, it's like a cat. Uh, I don't know what the symbol in the center is, and it's surrounded with stars, and it has Patriot Front, Life, Liberty, Victory, and then some oh, like what are those like what are those like flowers that the Romans always put on the side of their fucking things that everyone in Europe is just so fucking absolutely horny for? I can't remember what they're called. 
The Soviet Union has it on like the hammer and sickle emblem, like around the side. You mean the but, olive leaves? Are they olive leaves? Yes, I think so. Okay. That's what's the, usually used like in the Olympics and all that. And the Romans oh, I was used referring it as well. To the, I was referring to the Aryan Brotherhood instead of the Oh, you're oh sorry, Aryan Brotherhood. I typed in Patriot Fund. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, Aryan Brotherhood. So they claim to be uh, Irish by origin? <laughs> Yes. Sounds good, but I doubt oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's a fucking three leaf clover with a swastika on it. Holy shit. Yeah. No, that the, the probably is some racist Irish people that started that. Probably police officers knowing, knowing the Irish in America. Fucking bunch of fucking fake Irish people. Like, so what the fuck is of, this? You know, the How Catholic can you Church? even call yourself Irish when you do this like next level British shit? This is West Brit fucking. <laughs> Uh -huh. The Irish Americans fucking annoy me every time I learn something new about them. Every, it's never something good. It's always, look at how more racist they've been. Look at how much uh -huh. whiter they've been than everyone else. They're like, That's why I like Irish Republican socialism. Uh, God, like... Yes, that uh, used to be a powerful force, but <clears throat> seems to have, you know, evaporated. There used yeah. to be uh, Jerry Adams was elected... <clears throat> On behalf of the uh, the political party associated with the IRA, uh, uh, Alf, uh, Finn, something. I'm Sinn getting Fein? confused. Sinn Féin, yeah, I'm getting confused with the Arabic. Uh, uh, yeah, Sinn Féin, you know, was a force at one point, you know, but they were just basically social democrats or maybe left social democrats at best. And uh, they certainly didn't persist and they don't, they're nowhere around right now, are they, Kara? Um. What's not around anymore? Sinn Féin. Oh, no, Sinn Féin's still around. Um, oh. They're in the election. They're, they won, like, a lot of uh, seats. Also, I got it the wrong way around. Aryan Brotherhood's the older one. Patriot Front's the newer one. Um, yeah. That was a stinky mistake. Um, but, yeah, no. Uh, fucking Aryan Brotherhood hasn't gone away, though. That's the thing a lot of people feel like, is you don't see them on the streets, but they're in the prisons, and they're doing what we used to do in the prisons, which is recruit. Because mm -hmm. prisoners, homeless people, best people to fucking start speaking to about Marxism. If anyone is actively aware and conscious mm -hmm. of the world around them, it's people that have to watch it go by mm -hmm. or watch it disappear entirely. Like Kevin Rashid Johnson. Kevin Rashid Johnson, he's made a return to form. He's corrected himself since the manipulation that occurred with him mm -hmm. by, uh, by pig infiltrators. Damn. Oh, I'm glad he's finally out. Uh-huh. Okay, so that's the problem. Okay, we understand. The problem in Gaza I'd like to uh, bring up is that uh, the genocide is continuing and the uh, and the American administration is, you know, playing around and claiming, you know, that, you know, Biden just did an interview on the way to a helicopter saying, you know, in three days, you know, we're going to have a breakthrough uh, ceasefire, you know, in Gaza. Bullshit. You know, they've been then, saying you know, this for weeks now. Yeah. You know, like, no way, you know, is there going to be a breakthrough, you know, because they're not agreeing, you know, to a permanent ceasefire. They want to if we... have a truce and then they want to start the war again after all the hostages are released. That's it. That's all. They said Israel agreed. They fucking said Israel agreed. What was it? A month ago, nearly now. Yeah. Where was it? Because you shouldn't need the U.S. should not need to travel to Israel for them to stop bombing. It should be pretty simple to go. We agree to a ceasefire. Let's stop as as attacking fucking refugee camps in the middle of the fucking desert. Yeah. Let's stop fucking blocking people of their basic fucking needs. Oh, yeah, like yeah. that still wasn't solved. The electricity and the water. Like we're still living in a world where a whole like territory that is caged up had its yeah. water and electricity turned off. Like, I, I, I feel like a lot of people with their gadgets and all that don't fucking think about that kind of stuff with their fucking, like, food-filled filled, food filled fridge, water straight out the tap. Imagine if yeah. that all just gone. They and then you have to leave possible, it all and run you know, away be because they're that. fucking bombing you. Yeah, no. It's, uh, you know, last I heard, only 50 trucks were making it through the crossing points. You know, the crossing points are basically shut down. They don't even have to have, you know, like, fascist activists coming there to shut the, down the crossing points. The military does it just... They just do it, you know, like automatically. And this mm -hmm. is, you know, like supported by the government. They are I not going to accept a permanent ceasefire. They want, you know, at most a truce in exchange for the hostages to be released. And then, you know, they want to continue again, you know, just like before, you know, when they had seven or was it 11 days? You know, I've heard two 
I think it was seven days, you know, that there was a truce previously with an exchange of some 40 hostages or something. It's possible, but they're not going to get all the hostages, you know, and then continue the war and kill everyone. Basically, that's what I they want to do. I recently saw a couple of disturbing... It's so impossible that they want to force people to want to leave, you know. And, you know, Palestinians, you know, even in the West Bank, they want to leave, you know, they want to leave Palestine. They really do sincerely want to leave, but there's nowhere that, for them to go. There's already two million refugees in Jordan, a million and a half in Lebanon, half a million in Syria, another half million in Iraq. You know, they're not going to be allowed into any other country, you know, even if they want to, you know, Israel certainly wants to. I mean, to especially now out. with Europe doing what it's doing and getting like really anti immigrant, like France yeah. and Britain both have a really big problem at the moment with like outright Islamophobia. Yeah. Even yeah, amongst I mean, the so-called left in France. Yeah, there's some rad libs, you know, calling for, you know, like supporting, you know, the right of the Palestinians to come into Canada. You know, there's a campaign, you know, of some rad libs, you know, like, I don't support such a campaign. No, we don't want the Kamala Palestinians Harris to be leaving. More... I mean, what's it? They should be allowed to, uh, I mean, the, the campaign to allow the process for them to enter if they decide to leave should definitely be there. But we need to be putting our efforts to stopping this genocide at any cost and yes. what we have in this situation you know um is just pure terror like the people uh want to flee because that's all you can do in a situation where there isn't a proper defense where is syria where's 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 iraq where's iran where's like any of these like neighboring states to do anything mm -hmm. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. is the is U.S., Russia, and China like that important to them more than Palestinian lives that they're just going to sit and do business? Yeah. Uh, well, the Arab League. Change. What yeah. the fuck is that even worth at yeah, this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kamala yeah, Harris still... is pretty much uh, even more or just as much as an mm -hmm. anti-immigrant candidate as Donald Trump is. Uh -huh. But Donald Trump really likes her prison policies. He actually donated money to her in 2013. <laughs> so they, they get along in certain ways. They're not as uh -huh. opposed to each other as one might think. Uh -huh. I mean, like, it's definitely going to be, like, less devastating to have Kamala than Trump. They're not equals because, like, one literally is saying they want to make us all illegal and wrap us up into camps. Personally... <laughs> Like the one who's eventually going to do it is better than the one that's going to do it straight away. If people would just acknowledge that they are eventually going to do it. It's too late this time. I am not saying people should vote for Kamala Harris. What I am telling people is if she does win, fucking struggle. I'm going to fly over there and smack you myself. I, I don't have the money to do it, so you'll pay for my tickets. But like fucking I, I, I'm sick of this shit because when Biden won, that wasn't a victory for the left, but it was definitely a breather that we should have been working through. That we should have, because it, it's a breather for the state. That's what the mm. state's doing it for. They're trying to calm shit down. They're trying to appease people. And so we need to go and punch those holes, show that it isn't actually serving us, show the problems for what they really are, show we're being taken for a fucking mug and keep the struggle going. But what do people do? Back to brunch. Let's just chill out. Let's do nothing. Let's Let's take the time to relax yes it's There's uh, a long direct time action that counts. you know none of the administrations uh the possible administrations are are going to solve even the, you know the beginning of any problem this is uh, a matter of direct action in the uh in the social movement in england now there's a direct action uh palestine direct action which is taking on elbit you know taking on the factories you know themselves they even, you know, drove a van, you know, through the front gate, you know, <laughs> of one factory there to take it all, you know, like, and, you know, advance as much as possible to, 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 uh, to take down the place, you know, physically. Okay, now, as far as Gaza I actually concerned, went to one of okay, those outfit ceasefire, protests. Ceasefire, you know, like, is not going to be happening, you know, there's not going to be a ceasefire. What they talk about by ceasefire, what they mean is that they're going to force Hamas to give up the struggle. Capitulation. You know, ceasefire against, you know, it's a, it's it's a military campaign against the Zionist occupation, and then let the Zionist occupation, you know, stay in place, and then they're going to retreat, you know, to the relatively non-populated areas, areas that they're going to forbid the Palestinians from returning to, which is now eighty-five percent, you know, of the Gaza Strip. Okay, this is their strategy. And then make life so miserable that either they die or they, you know, force some other country, you know, to take them in, you know, on a charitable humanitarian liberal basis. 
you know, this is their strategy. They are not going to stop this war. The only way to stop this war is by military means, by war, war against war. And Iran, you know, is in a position now to be able to do so. And they've got the defensive, you know, means, you know, technological and missile defense, you know, from Russia that they can do so without suffering an enormous, you know, retaliation that would turn their population against the government. So they're setting it up, you know, so that they can attack without being, you know, defeated, you know, uh, thereafter. And, uh, and uh, this is what would... is necessary, you know, and then, then the Zionists will be forced to back down. Then they will be forced to agree to a ceasefire. You know, and which is, you know, uh, what the Israeli be... pu pu public wants. You know, the Israeli public, you know, three quarters now want a ceasefire with return of the hostages. And a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, means no more October 7th. You know, but this isn't told, you know, to the Israeli public and to the Jewish public and to the general public. They don't know that what a ceasefire really means. It means, you know, that there won't be any more October the 7th because there will be no more occupation. So, you know, isn't this what, you know, people were convinced that they should be fighting for? They can't there are gotten there, you know. They, by speak. fighting, they haven't achieved you know, any such goal. They have not defeated Hamas. So logically, eventually, and sooner rather than later, you know, they have to realize that ceasefire means an end to the October seventh, and then they will have peace with Hamas, even. But they don't even believe that, you know, because they have such a racist attitude to Hamas, and their, you know, Islamophobia is so intense they cannot even conceive of negotiating with Hamas, even though it was done successfully. And Hamas, you know, stopped, you know, firing missiles on, for seven days you know, in November, but they don't know that. And the media doesn't tell them anything like that. You know, their interpretation of reality is so skewed, you know, to by Zionist propaganda that they cannot even think for themselves anymore. And that's our role. You know, we're there to, you know, to tell them. That's what I went down to the Jewish community with the vigil to speak to them one by one, because it's the only way I could break through the censorship. I yeah. would trust Iran. To do it. I because they are their interests are scrambled because they have had the ability to strike Israel the whole time, obliterate them, even and they have done nothing other than retaliate. So yeah. I expect them only to retaliate, I expect them only to act in that sort of chauvinistic way. And um, so I don't let uh let Andrew forget what they want to say as well. Um, I will just quickly also say, um, that like the the situation is kind of one of those where i mean like we got to be careful of what kind of ceasefires we're getting into we can't agree to a ceasefire that disarms the palestinian people one that would yeah. sabotage the struggle and it's why we've got to kind of make sure that if uh, hamas is representing the intifada the intifada is going to have a struggle that they're going to be dealing with and making sure hamas represents their interests and doesn't sell them out and does agree to you know does a shin fein basically and like wax everyone under the bus for their own bourgeois means like these guys are even more reactionary than fucking um uh what what uh fucking what's their name and uh how have i forgot the fucking name of the party yeah, Fatah. Like, they're even more reactionary than Fatah when it comes to being bourgeois. So, like, we're dealing with mm -hmm. a party that can be very opportunistic at times. So that that's always going to be the big concern is, like, I'd rather the PFLP be representing the Intifada in this situation. That would, that would be a lot better. Like, we'd probably get a sick ceasefire that fucking, like, makes very strong requests of Israel. But, like, you know, it'd be written in a way that's also reasonable, so it trips up their own public. You know, the Marxist route of trying to fucking, like, mess with the instability that's already there in the, in the position that you're making by uncovering truth in a way that actually meets people where their minds are sort of operating at. But it's the, you know... Um, <laughs> The situation is very dire because we can't have a ceasefire like that. And at the end of the day, if a ceasefire occurs, it's a breather. It is not the end because a ceasefire where there's an agreement between Israel and Palestine is not a ceasefire. They are an occupier. So long as they are occupying, there is no ceasefire. Police officers can still fucking put bullets in people if the soldiers ain't around to do it for them. So at the end of the day, we are talking about a very vicious country. Sorry, I'm rambling on a bit, Andrew. Drop the beat. Yeah, but it's true, true, all true, yeah. So Andrew had something to say. The troops have so. to withdraw from Gaza. That has to be, you know, part of the, us have permanent ceasefire and they're all willing to do that. They're not willing to have a permanent ceasefire. 
So the war continues, uh, and there has to be, you know, some sort there of are two things action like which is going to break to the hold that they have over the Palestinians. In the West Bank as well, there's an intifada right now that is increasing yeah. in intensity. And so it should continue to do. Drop the beat as well. And some and then, to say you know, for a long time. as well. So, you know, this is going to continue Wait. on. Doc, uh, Andrew's been waiting a long time to say something. Uh, drop the beat, Andrew. I will say that two things, in fact. Not only do I think that ceasefire without liberation is nothing more than capitulation. From an American perspective, on this next election, I'm not saying the bullet is not is yet necessary, but if Donald Trump and gets elected and Project 2025 goes through, as a longtime fan of Malcolm X, I'd say it's better the bullet than the ballot at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, direct action is, uh, is the... Uh... Is a driving force. It's the motor force of the social revolution. You know, it's not small. You know, direct action, no matter how small it is, you know, is a motor force. You know, that starts a whole chain of events. We yes. we have to not kid ourselves, though. Uh, a ceasefire does not necessarily mean capitulation. If you engage in a ceasefire that sabotages your people's struggle, absolutely but there are times in struggle where fighting will get you obliterated but a ceasefire meaning they're willing to have a ceasefire they're afraid of the situation they're having social instability because they've probably already killed a lot of you so they want things to chill down a bit you take advantage of it you arm up you build up you fight again like that's the whole point of the hostage tactic but israel went full scorched earth in a way that the palestinian organizations weren't expecting this was not expected reaction. They thought it would just be like another bombing situation that would end after maybe a month or two, not mass slaughter to the point of nearly 200,000 people. So like the, um, the, the, the whole sort of situation is one of those where if Israel does decide to want a ceasefire, the Palestinians need to be very stiff about their pre prerequisites for mm -hmm. no conditions on themselves, conditions to be placed on Israel because Israel broke international law. I, I know international law is a dodgy load of fucking bollocks, but if we go by trying to appeal to the national community and how you're representing yourself, you know, it's kind of the white paper situation all fucking over again. But um, you want to like frame it in a way where you are like really targeting what people's expectations of standards are within society. So you pull up international law on genocide and you make a statementation that we should have no prerequisites on us because the, the, the genocide has been committed and you can speak of it to like primarily highlight the, the genocide of now and then tie it to the continuous genocide that's been going on, make it a very big piece to hit the world with. Like, that could take the world by storm and like use the UN as like uh, using the trying to use the UN as a platform for this, a country that supports Palestine, maybe speaking this up would definitely be great. Um, is Ireland allowed in the UN yet? Uh, maybe they could fucking do something. <laughs> hmm. I mean, in the EU, they've been That's fucking great. Point. It's in the, uh, the Irish fucking member of uh, European member of parliament. Uh, I don't know, but uh the point, uh, oh, the point that you made is that uh, uh, a temporary ceasefire could be beneficial. And it was, you know, uh, in the first instance in November there. You know, I could see Hamas agreeing to a temporary ceasefire at this point for, uh, I think they the projected the period is uh, three weeks in which they would exchange, you know, some 40 hostages for some hundreds of Palestinians again. And, but they can't, you know, give up, you know, on the core, you know, hostages, the military hostages that they have, you know, they have a couple of generals in there, even, you know, from the Golan uh, Brigade. But uh, there's no the friendly way, way you know, to present this sort of, ceasefire you know, either. There's like yeah, no friendly way to really. Truce. It's not even a ceasefire, it's called a truce, you know. But I don't think that, you know, the Zionists are already, you know, willing to concede that, you know, either. There's, I there's... feel like it has to be something that's kind of like written in a way that like appeals to the idea of trying to like maintain 
the peace, not being in for war, because so long as you stay this position that you maintain your need to maintain your ability to protect yourself as an occupied people, you apply that article in the UN. The UN has a specific article that people who are occupied have a fucking right to defend themselves. So you yes. invoke that in your yeah. position. And so you state that there is no uh, like position that you can make on us for us to give up our weapons or to give up our institutions or our leaders. Those stay as they are. You are not changing that. And then put conditions on them based on them breaking the the the, the Geneva Convention, the Geneva Convention, and the genocide laws in the UN uh, Charter, and pull that up. So then you can create a host. It's kind of like a hostile ceasefire where you're putting the ante up because the friendly ceasefire has been offered. It's been offered fucking several times. They've got to just lay it on the table where the international world, the international community, can see it can see it for what it is it gets propagated and it amplifies protest hmm. like we need to like big up the like the there's approach the, because like israel needs to a, be held accountable yes there's one way in which a permanent ceasefire can be imposed and that is by direct action again that is there would be uh some countries that would be sending their troops into gaza as a peacekeeping force under the authority of the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council, in which they would force the Zionist troops back and keep them off of Gaza, and they would form a security corridor like they do on the border with Lebanon and with Syria. Then the UN peacekeeping forces, you know, would be installed there, and then they would guarantee the peace of a permanent ceasefire. And then the, you know, the Zionists they couldn't that. complain, you know, because the you know the you know the UN would guarantee that there would be no more October the seventh. You know, on top of Hamas's guarantee of a, a permanent ceasefire. The UN can't be trusted in these kind of things. What I'm more pointing to is that, like, in this kind of situation, you want to look like you're pushing for the longevity of peace, even if you intend to continue to struggle. Even don't hide that. Speak that you seek for the liberation of Palestine. Don't even hide it. But just speak in a sense that you also are like a peacekeeper. You don't want to have to fight. You are pushed to fight. Because it puts it puts it on them. It's using it to do politics, like to engage with the world and just show what Israel is. You know, like the the, the people that are like even like reference all the times Hamas has actually approached I Israel and tried to do the peaceful option because they've done it a oh, lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like use it as this like political uh, polemic. That's it. Use it as a polemic to hit the world with. Yes, there's position, you know, but the media, you know, corporate media doesn't cover anything that Hamas says or does, you know. But not Hamas normally, has but if it's, in the a, past if it's offered to recognize the state of Israel, the Zionist state, they've offered to recognize it on a mutual basis if the Zionist state recognizes Palestine. Well, especially here in America. I'm not necessarily saying the news will just report on it itself, but I'm saying people hearing that Hamas has made a specific like treaty op uh, op uh, proposition. That would hit the international news to a certain degree. They might not tell you what's in it, but, they've but you're going to know it they've exists and you you can find those things. But I'm sort of like, um, you know, I feel well, like they have been extraordinarily like concessive compared to what they really need yeah, to be right now, though. For sure. Like yeah, they shouldn't right. even be like offering recognition of yeah, fucking Israel. And instead they're called a terrorist organization when they are, you know, like... <laughs> They're a very sophisticated, both military and political organization with international networks and everything. You know, like, oh, yeah, no, no, like, I mean, Hamas fucking, no, they, they know what they're doing better than I know what they're doing, but fucking, um, they're always concerned on me. I always try and stick by what the PFLP is doing, and uh, if not the DFLP, um, the th th those, those uh, two are pretty decent organizations. And the Palestinian People's Party and there's like seven different, you know, resistance organizations. Well, Plus, the PFLP you know, is a, an anti-revisionist Marxist-Leninist party, and then the DFLP yeah. is a Maoist party. Yes. Well, Part DFLP, of me feels uh, like is, is, is uh, yeah, it's, it c can be, you know, it's sort of a mixed bag. But anyway, um, but... I think there's some, like, there's like a sub group in like the pflp that are like marxist leninist nasserists i think it's like mostly yeah. stuff like the three circles of of uh, bag, africa yeah, well, which you know, like they, uh, they have they also have trotsky support too you know as well as malice support 
and the anarchists they're nowhere to be found you know <laughs> their position on uh, palestine is nowhere to be found you know like they don't know what they're doing they're still into their uh building social communes uh and uh getting laid that was about as far as I, i'd like to sort of you know like make that sort of nasty note about the anarchists because you know they're not doing enough they should start to get active you know in international affairs part of me feels like if gaddafi's son from Libya, you know, Gaddafi in Libya, his son had gotten elected. He could have sent people over to Gaza by now to fight against the IDF. Yeah. I He's would the favorite not. presidential Let's... candidate. Uh, his name is uh, Islam Al. His name is, oh, his first name. Uh, Al Islam Al Gaddafi is his uh, surname. Yeah. And he has a uh, an academic who's working with him as a spokesperson, you know, but. They haven't responded to my initiatives when I try to contact them on behalf of the direct democracy movement, which I continue by myself on behalf of like, Maria. Gaddafi yes. was very good at being publicly anti-Zionist, but he did some pretty shady shit with Zionists behind closed doors. Probably, but uh, well, there was a uh, one. On, uh, there was one like uh, like yes. liberation fighter who like missed the plane, and. Um, Gaddafi looked like he'd gone cold when he saw that he had missed that plane and that plane ended up being like brought down by the IDF of everyone being like I can't remember if everyone was killed in it or or if they were arrested but yeah so they brought down a Libyan plane yes it was a Libyan plane with about 156 passengers yeah yeah so then they killed them um yeah the he was also supposed to be on that plane there was a lot of other different like members of his group that were on there he he missed it because he was overslept (laughs) overslept wow the comforts uh... of of, like Gaddafi's like billionaire fucking home like (laughs) Uh, wasn't his daughter killed by Ronald Reagan's airstrike come closer to the mic can't hear you What about his daughter? No, no, still can't hear you. You have to come closer. Wasn't his son or or daughter killed by either George H. W. Bush's or Ronald Reagan's airstrike? Yeah, uh, 1996. Me, George, yeah, but... it was his adopted daughter. Yeah. Oh no, that, she was killed that when was his house the, was bombed uh, that... an assassination attempt. He was sleeping outside in a tent be- because it was hot. <laughs> you know, that means Bill dead. Clinton. I went there, you know, I was invited in 1996, you know, together with the international delegations in solidarity. We did a demonstration uh, against the bombardment, you know, and uh, and then we heard a speech from um, from the uh, from his son who spoke there at the uh, uh, commemoration where they put up this uh, monument showing uh, a fist holding an American uh, F-16 fighter plane, you know, and it's this, you know, being crushed by a hand. Yeah, so that's... Uh, I was really involved, you know, like it was such a disaster, you know, and it was Obama who allowed, and I confronted the his uh, foreign secretary at the time, Ross, in a video that was uh, being undertaken by some Israeli, you know, like right lip, I happened to be in there, and I confronted him, said, yeah, you know, we met before, you're the one, you know, who uh, was at the uh, uh, Solidarity Conference, and the uh, recognition conference at C- Columbia University with Libya when the United States recognized the uh, government of Gaddafi, you know, and Gaddafi gave up, you know, the nuclear program. And they were supposed to, you know, sort of, you know, have an agreement, a treaty, you know, a peace treaty. And they ended up, you know, like destroying Libya, you know, with Obama in place. I also and, you heard know, that such Gaddafi hypocrites, was... you know, like it called them to it, you know. And then he started defending, you know, the Zionists. And I, and I exposed him about that as well, you know, because there was, he was referring back to the Nakba, you know, trying to push the, uh, the line, you know, that the, uh, that Israel was defending itself against the invading Arab armies, you know, and I pointed out, you know, that they only came in to the, uh, to the Nakba, you know, to stop the Nakba from happening a year after it had started. And then they only came up as far as the green line, you know, they never even entered into 48, you know, occupied Palestine territory that's called Israel. And so he had nothing to say after that, you know, he just shut up, you know, and so I just didn't say anything, you know, I let, you know, open space, quietness, waiting for his answer. In the anticipation of an answer with no answer, you know, because he was guilty and he knew it. I was about 11 years old the day Gaddafi was assassinated. The way CNN told it is that he was this brutal dictator who was having people raped and murdered. 
Yeah. Only to find out years later that that was CIA propaganda. And in fact, yeah. the reason he was murdered is because he wanted to make a gold back currency for not only Libya, but the rest of Africa. Yeah, that's right. All true. Yeah. 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 And then the same sort of, you know, like technique is used by the Zionists to initially justify the uh, occupation of Gaza with all the horror stories that they were counting time after time without any proof. And people still believe it, you know, because the only thing that they watch are is television news and they have seem to have forgotten. They've gone amnesiatic about the lies that they had proposed and propagated previously. Oh, well, okay. Okay, so it's going to continue, and we will too. Very good. Okay, now yes. conclusions. Yes, you have a video to show us, Kara. Yeah, well, I think I you have heard a... about Stalin yet. What's that? You were you wanted to talk about Stalin? I didn't get into the part about Stalin and his anti anti semitism yet. Okay, go it's ahead. This fight against anti-Semitism, which I wanted to talk about. Yeah, I know it was true. You know, when my father was in Russia as a refugee from Poland, you know, anti-Semitism was illegal. There was even one anti-Semite that my father denounced that ended up, you know, going to prison. But my father ended up going to prison himself for missing a day of work, you know, by some uh, Jewish woman communist who was the head of the Soviet, supposedly, a commissar, appointed, not elected, of course. The and, only part uh, I she was to probably go. as anti-Semitic as the guy that he denounced in the first place, you know, even though she was Jewish. The Jewish communists, you know, ended up, you know, using their own anti-Semitism, too. The part That's that I, I wanted to go into in particular is that not only were active anti-Semites, depending on the severity of their crimes, put into gulags, but the very violent ones were executed by firing squad. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anti-Semitism was a I sign of uh, counter-revolutionaries. You know, they were considered to be, by definition, counter-revolutionaries. And so it was an easy way to identify them because they thought they could get away with it, you know, because they were just using anti-Semitism as a cover for their counter-revolutionary politics. I will say as a revolutionary, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say most of all. Uh -huh. The use of a uh, firing squad is because of the psychological damage uh, that occurs when an individual commits an execution. And that's one of the reasons why the Soviets adopted it too. Uh, so you have everyone shoot at them. So, like, <laughs> kind of questioning yourself, you know, like, did I really, was I really the one that hit them? Who knows? So, like, it puts you in a situation where your mind is less likely to melt in the way that you've, like, shot someone who is unarmed. That shit will fuck with you till the end of your life if you do that, like, yourself. Like, it will live with you. Um, well, you know, somewhat of an idea. I, I mean, you know, like, it can make people go cold for us soldiers if they forget the faces of people that they've killed that are close up on the ground when they've been in the middle of like adrenaline filled combat where you don't tend to think so clearly like and think tell ask them about how that shit haunts them in their dreams like that shit that shit fucking like will the brain is not designed to be a fucking murderer like it that that like that's the thing. Slaughter is just not good for our minds. Now in 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 due combat where you're fighting against someone, it's a lot less damaging than like if you're killing someone who is unarmed, but it's still not healthy for you. And the fight or flight response being active for long periods of time really fucks with you too. Now I want to point out a bit of weird hypocrisy that then after the war because they wanted to like demonstrate the the lack of humanity of fucking Nazis, which is a slippery road to start fucking around with. They did a hanging. Where one guy pulls a lever for many people. One pull, a lot of lives just died. And yeah, they're filthy fucking Nazis, but the brain is a little mushy bit of fucking material that doesn't give a fuck about your opinion. Like, you, you gotta be... We can't be being barbarists just because they're fucking barbaric. We don't start going, yeah, let's get out the torture devices. We use guillotines for kings, something the French invented to be humane. Like, we don't go, yeah, let's lynch the king. We get the guillotine out. That's us kind of taking a bit of a humane approach. Lynching 
Motherfucker. I've heard the guillotine being described as a swift breeze down the back of the neck. I mean, it, it's you know, it's like a, it's like in your haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little trim off the top. <laughs> Charles the first, yes, was the first, and then Charles the third will be the second, I suppose. But anyway, what is happening in England? You know, you have a report on on the uh, your uh, Nazis or neo Nazis or whatever they what do they call themselves? Yeah, what's so uh, was, I saw that, a report that... from Loki about uh, about that guy there. Yeah, no, so um, I'm going to briefly talk about um, the feeling of Muslims in the country right now, and then I'm going to get Loki up because <laughs> Mandem, he's spitting facts. Yes, like, he's good. Uh, he's good there. Yeah. Uh, what's it? Tommy. So I've got Who that is prepared. Who is Tommy Robinson? He's a prick. But okay, so right now we gotta really consider the situation here. Um, and I'll even inflect on it from my own feelings from my community too, because there's a bit of a you know, the whole rise of the right is kind of spooking everyone, but it's really hitting the Muslims very hard because they've been highly targeted by uh the EDL, the inbred defense yeah. league. Um and uh fucking uh <laughs> <laughs> Should we just call them the IDF from now on? Uh, I mean, they love the IDF. Oh, spoilers. Um, but the <laughs> impact of the far right riots on Muslims revealed in poll as 92% feel less safe living in the UK. Now, the independent does sound like they're speaking in tongues with the order that they wrote that in, but to like rearrange that into like the way that most people speak rather than this weird news speak. Far right people have made like this survey basically feel like a, a, a survey of Muslim in response to the far right protests have said by 92% that they don't want to fucking be here anymore. Like they're feeling unsafe um, or at least less safe. It's kind of a vague statement, less safe, but mm -hmm. well, no, it says much less safe as a result of the violent disorder. So what's it? Um, The poll was conducted between the 5th and the 6th of August with a panel of 1,519 uh, participants from various backgrounds reported one in six people have personally experienced racist attacks since the riots began on 30th of July, while two in three people witnessed one... Verbal attacks are the most commonly faced by Muslims, with 28% followed by 16% reporting abuse online. 4% said that they had experienced a physical attack in the weeks since the disorder. Wow. Muslim census co-founder Sadiq uh, Dur uh, Durasat said, quote, <laughs> we have heard stories about hijabis but that don't feel safe to leave their homes to go to, or go to work. We've seen a witch hunt directed to people of the Muslim faith, uh, mentioning Allah and his messenger, and people are concerned for their safety. Uh, for days, far-right individuals targeted mosques, Muslim-owned businesses and hotels, housing asylum seekers in cities, including London, Liverpool, Bristol, Blackpool, and Belfast, my town as well. <laughs> Violence broke out after misinformation was spread following the deadly stabbings of three girls at a Taylor Swift-themed dance class at Southport on 29th of July. Um, uh, since the riots, more than 900 people have been arrested. It's actually over 1,000 now. There are more wow. than 400 charged. It's now 600 charged, including for racial hatred. Um Mosques around the country have advised worshippers to take safety measures, including refraining from traveling alone, avoid leaving their homes after sunset, and consider traveling in groups to avoid being a target. Hmm. So, like, you know, this is the same reaction that I have seen, uh, like, just happen from, I mean, women in general, but the trans community, too, is just like, yo, hmm. this shit is terrifying. Like, wanting to get the fuck out like 
I don't want to be near this fucking place at the moment. It just feels like fucking like shit's just about to explode because this is a taste. They can do a lot worse than this. What? Yeah. Uh, fucking it does, days it was, of they protest? They create an atmosphere like that. You know, people, you know, forcing people to leave. They want a lily white country. This uh, is why I, as a Jew, want to move to where my ancestors lived in Belarus. Oh, yes. <laughs> Like, That's where the uh, Jewish happening. homeland should have been established. Yeah, I know it's happening over in the UK right now, but this close to my side of the pond means it's only a matter of time until the fascist riots spread here. But we're more powerful than they are. We're just not organized like they are. That's what I would argue. You know, like is the solution. We have not not the United while, we're, we while we're not organized, though, we are less powerful. We're feeble at the moment. If we get organized, we could kick the shit out of them. But right now, they got us in the slaughterhouse. And nobody yeah. seems to be, like, giving it yeah. the level of, like, people shouldn't panic. Panicking is not useful. But, like, you know. <laughs> in the state <laughs> I live in, in the state of Tennessee, the fascists are way more powerful. Hmm. But we can be if we get organized, you know, get all the minority nationalities together, you know, and start meeting up. I think Kara was saying something. I'm sorry. No, 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 you're all right. Yeah. But uh, in England, I I just always have a bit of a resty bitch face. (laughs) No, it's all good. I do sometimes too. It's all good. But in England, I've seen demonstrations in which, you know, the anti racists, you know, are much more powerful, much bigger numbers. Than the uh, racist uh, rioters, you know, who are being protected by the police, who are keeping the anti-racists away from them. That's one reason we're moving up north to Michigan. Uh huh. But you know, like I don't see that happening in the United States. You know, the anti-racists have not formed, you know, big anti uh, anti-racist demonstrations uh, yet. Yeah, I mean, it can be. You know, it can be. You know, done very easily because it was done. You know, be previously in the Black Lives Matter movement you know but it didn't sure. endure you know like it's dissolved you know like it's the students have taken over but the blm you know should be coming back now because it's the time they're going to be facing sure. a challenge especially in nashville oh okay let's see what, let's you know yeah everyone should listen to this you know loki has has had a lot of research you know that he's accomplished that he's going to be giving us is she still calling? Uh, it doesn't matter. Like uh, I ain't answering the phone while I'm in the middle of a stream. I thought um, you were the one calling. I see. Uh, what's it? Um, Your internet is slow. I mean, I, I will. No, no, no. I've not pressed play yet. I, I wanted to say something. So, like, I mean, the situation that we really see here, it's like, you know, it, it's making minorities in general feel incredibly uncomfortable and wanting to get the fuck out like i long for dairy get me to dairy anyone can just ship me to dairy i'll go like i'll i'll, fuck, I'll be a street urchin in dairy I'll like uh, but do you live I'll in what i believe do you live in Northern ireland or the republic of ireland Derry is in the fucking irish occupied territories you know the fucking oh. six counties yeah, which part of Ireland do you live in? Not I live in England. Like... Oh, the England, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I literally just said I want to get the fuck out of England. I go for I go for Scotland. So I'll take I'm that. Gonna... They, um, they got I'm like smoking. social democracy or some shit. I did far, foreign concept to England. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I was kind of smoking a THC joint. <laughs> Good, better than alcohol for sure. Yeah. Better than morphine in my case. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay, let's hear from Loki. Okay, Loki, drop the beat, brother. Who um, is Tommy Robinson and who helped him get to where he is today? Uh, when we look into the background of the organization he founded, the English Defense League, we could take the view that it was intended to be an offshoot of the terrorist. Zionist organization, the JDL, the Jewish Defense League. In fact, his co-founder at the English Defense League was an individual who called himself Paul Ray. Paul Ray, prior to founding the English Defense League, 
infiltrated the international solidarity movement, a pro-Palestinian organization which Rachel Corrie had been a member of. Paul Ray infiltrated and spied on this pro-Palestinian organization and then submitted the information to several different intelligence agencies. Following his work for Israel, Paul Ray founded the English Defence League with Tommy Robinson. When it came time for the English Defence League to be registered on Company's house, that was carried out by a former Israeli soldier, Roberta Moore. Moore led what they called the EDL's Jewish Just to briefly say, Roberta Moore, she's got her fingers in a lot of fucking pies when it comes to white supremacy in Europe. She's a fucking character that if you keep researching a lot of this stuff, she's going to appear a lot. Fucking evil little bitch. Absolute Nazi. The Jewish or Zionist Defense League has carried out plenty of terror attacks at mosques in the U.S. from what I've heard. Yeah, yeah, the Jewish Defense League is fucking all over the place, and the ADL I... is straight up a uh, sister organization of the Jewish Defense League. Pre pre preferably, I call them the Zionist Defense League. Yeah, uh, the ADL, you know, they assassinated O'Day in California. What's it? The, um, uh, the fucking uh, EDL. They push a lot of the thing of trying to reorientate anti-Semitism towards uh, Islam direct, uh, specifically mm -hmm. um, and like targeting Arabs in that regard, but always being sort of flaky on how they do it so they can generalize, so they can target Muslims generally, so they go for all sorts of different peoples. But Arabs are like a really big target in this anti-Semitism. And that's what it shows them always having this interesting relationship with Zionism. Oh my god, fuck off, stop calling me. Yeah. Okay, Loki has more. He's got more information. I was trying to say something where I fucking... Someone doesn't get what hanging up when you ring them fucking means. Something mm -hmm. about the EDL? Yeah, fucking EDL. So they do that shit where they try and go like, uh, if they find people that are anti-Semitic to Jewish people, what they'll try and do is they'll try and coax them. They'll do this thing of, you need to be nice to them now. Islam is the bigger danger right now. So they won't even like turn around and say they're actually against anti-Semitism against Jewish people. It's right. just a like an unholy alliance against Islam between the christian the well in this case it's not the american evangelicals it's what the fucking protestant like uh what is it like ascensionists or whatever the fuck like the fucking loyalists bunch of bunch of fucking british protestants it's basically what edl concise of you look at a lot of their symbols all these fucking crosses and shit like uh they're very very like european christianity and so it's this unholy alliance between them and zionism i wonder i've seen this before oh the troubles huh Yeah, that's the... Uh, Remember that one. More. Yeah, More that's the Kahana symbol. What they called the EDL's Jewish unit, which regularly partnered with the Zionist Federation to hold demonstrations outside the Israeli embassy. Roberta Moore is pictured here with the vice chair of the Zionist Federation at the time, Jonathan Hoffman. Jonathan Hoffman is a former vice chair of the Zionist Federation, members of the racist English Defense League, or EDL, attended a demonstration that Hoffman helped organize. He is photographed alongside Roberta Moore, the founder of the EDL's Jewish division. She will later express her admiration for Anders Breivik, the neo-Nazi who murdered 77 people in Norway. When Roberta Moore was asked if the EDL was exploiting the Zionist movement, she replied, if anything, we are exploiting them. I've received these packages today. He's admired somewhat as one of the brains of the EDL. The He's just got a delivery of quotes from the Quran from his researcher in Israel. Roberta Moore is pictured here alongside the head of the Canadian branch of the Zionist terror organization, the JDL, and the genocidal Israeli politician, Moshe Feiglin, who has called for the complete annihilation of all human life in Gaza. On the 28th of February 2013,
The English Defence League, as registered on Company's house, was changed. The name of the organisation became the Jewish Defence League, JDL, UK. It's important to remember that the JDL is designated as a terrorist organisation by the US government. It was founded by Mir Kahan, the well-known Israeli fascist who advocated for the complete ethnic cleansing of Palestine. But the connections of Tommy Robinson and the English Defence League to the JDL do not end there. One of the earliest supporters of the EDL and a regular speaker at their rallies outside of the Israeli embassy was none other than Rabbi Nachum Shifrin. How would you feel if one day your children or your grandchildren are saying five times a day, Allah Akbar! Well, this is what is coming down on you here and now. It will be recalled on this day that it was the EDL that started the liberation of England. Nachim Shifrin was the driver for the founder of the JDL, Mir Kahan. The only other time the English Defence League was registered on Company's house was by Tommy Robinson's personal assistant, Helen Gower. When she registered the organisation, the name was the English and Jewish Defence League. So the question has to be asked here, was Tommy Robinson's English Defence League founded to be an offshoot of the Zionist terrorist organisation, the JDL? And if so, why hasn't that been mentioned or written about extensively in the British media? Tommy Robinson then went on to be a Shillman Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Now, the David Horowitz Freedom Center shares funders with the Friends of the IDF and illegal settlements in the West Bank. But that position was directly funded by tech billionaire Robert Shillman. Who is Robert Shillman? Well, he was a board member on the Friends of the IDF at the very same time that he was funding Tommy Robinson to the tune of £8,000 a month according to his other former assistant, Lucy Brown. Here we see Robert Shillman speaking at the Zionist Organization of America and describing his pen and his checkbook as weapons. With this pen and my checkbook, I provide ammunition. I wield a pen to provide ammunition to those organizations like ZOA, ZOA who are on the front lines in this battle. Tommy Robinson has also received funding from the US neocon think tank, the Middle East Forum, which was quoted 13 times by Anders Breivik in his manifesto he released before killing over 70 people. The head of the Middle East Forum is Greg Roman, who's a former employee of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Now, all of these connections would certainly cause you to question where Tommy Robinson's ultimate loyalties lie, especially when he has been pictured on the top of a tank in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights of Syria and stated so clearly that he would enter a war on behalf of Israel. If there was a war tomorrow, which there will be, because I'll probably start at the end of this session, if there was a war and it kicked off, I would be there on the front line fighting for Israel. Save our kids? What about the 20,000 kids killed by Israel in Gaza? When Israel killed three former British soldiers with an airstrike in Gaza, what was the response of Britain's patriot Tommy Robinson? British people that do aid work in Gaza are cucks. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. How can Tommy Robinson define himself as a patriot, but speak with such callousness about the death of former British soldiers? Yeah. I think Tommy Robinson owes an apology to the families of John Chapman, James Kirby and James Henderson. Those who serve as an attachment to the war industry have sought to pin the blame for what is happening in this country on Russia. It's interesting because there is far more of a material connection between Tommy Robinson and a particular genocidal ally in the Middle East. As you've seen, 
Unfortunately, the mainstream media across the last decades have been a complete deluge of dehumanization and demonization of the most vulnerable in society. Today, you have an alternative in Double Down News, which is publishing information which goes against the grain. Please support them in any way you can by joining their Patreon. First time I've now. heard of Double Down News, they interviewed Roger Waters in a pretty good interview about the translation. Okay, that was excellent. I, I forgot I was muted. Uh, the um, what's it? I, I, that's a new video that is there. Uh, so I'm probably gonna watch that afterwards. But uh, th this is um, you know, low key. It's been a hell of a lot of massive facts are really important to consider here, and like the situation that's going on with these fascists and their relationship has a weird relationship to the cold war and what ended up happening with fascism fascism kept forming these like networks the european liberation front is one that keeps like reforming and disappearing um i mean like fascists are gonna fucking liberate anything <laughs> fucking like false advertisement it's all capitalism ever gives you fucking bullshit on the label fucking bullshit in the tin but the uh fucking um uh, what's it people like mosley push this basically like european nationalism and so what you see is a lot of like you know even though some of these anti-semitic groups being willing to like uh they'll either like do one or two things they'll use palestine as an excuse to be extraordinarily anti-semitic including against israel or they'll collaborate with israel because israel has no problem collaborating with anti Semitic people so long as they will like hide it a little bit and you know engage in support for Israel and that's their big cover mm -hmm. and that allows them to be freely functional oh, and yeah, like they love it, yeah. opportunistic yeah. So, here in America we had George Lake and Rockwell I mean like the EDL had its own Jewish division and everything but there were still members with swastika tattoos I mean they may or may not have joined from National Front uh <laughs> a lot of them left and went back to National Front as well. National Front still exists. They, they've been around since like the 50s. They're old. Well, if, uh, yeah, they just changed their name a little bit. And uh, the daughter expelled her father, you know, pretending, you know, that she wasn't a fascist anymore. But now that the uh, left United Front there, calling itself the new popular front, which it is not. Anyway, you know, they have the uh, they are the first party now. But the president is refusing to allow them to form a government. They haven't been called upon, you know, to form the government, you know, like a, yeah. I was looking forward, you know, to a Dunya coming on, you know, to tell us what's happening in France, you know, because this is crisis there, you know, there is no government in France right now, <laughs> basically. This is, this is like the fucking monarchy, like, and that what they can do to fucking, uh, um, what's it? Uh, well, the what state, they you know, do they don't to have stop a, a government there. from being set up. Well, no, but I mean, yeah. like, it's the, it's the president, like, their ability to just, like, basically go, Well, fuck yeah, you, and you're just bullshit. another name for monarch. That's right. Yeah, it's so the U.S. is the same fucking like problem, but in a different way. It doesn't work that yeah. way with the U.S., they're slightly so more democratic just... in certain ways, but only if you've got a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the Supreme Court, uh, affirmed, you know, the president, you know, can do no wrong, you know, just like any king, you know, same thing. I mean, yeah. do you know the, the did you just hear about the Supreme Court hearing where it turned around and basically that's, said that like presidents can just do whatever they want with the, that's the Supreme Court? That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's a totally monarchist, yeah. Well, like, oh, yeah, they, no, like Project 2025 is like perfectly legal, and I'm like, fucking hell. We're in okay. for a ride. So that means Rich. We have to come to an end of the monarchy finally, even though they've just changed the name to be president. I mean, it what's it? Not end. if we come to a proper end of the monarchy with the Republican socialist replacement rather than letting the fucking bourgeoisie put some fucking liberal trash in there. Not even that. I want an end to the state itself. Not even a dissolute, you know, gradual elimination of the state, you know, like forget it. The state is never going to allow itself to be eliminated. 
No, you, you do just eliminate that state, but like when you form a class organization of working people that specifically needs to oppress the bourgeoisie to prevent it from rising up, you create yeah. a state. Like, so that becomes a new state that needs to then also eventually be fucking crushed. Um, because it's not even though the, the state will wither away is the statement that said it's not like it's gonna just fucking do that itself. It's not like it's gonna magically go. Well, I'm in favor of wander off but into, not a state. into the woods like it's a fucking like uh like uh Alice in the Wonderland or something. The little rabbit just wanders off in the woods. It's not a state it'll just wither away. The 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 imagination of fucking like dull Marxists. Wither, no, not wither. Passive. We've got to drown it. You know, we've got to get rid of the state and replace it with yeah, the you gotta have your hands on it like a it's workers a workers' federation of federations, you know, that's what I think. Yeah. Well, that's why, like, the party needs to not be doing the actual statesman stuff. They need to be being the scientific fucking socialists, studying society and making their intellectual pieces, putting positions out there, but also still doing activism on the ground and engaging with the people and keeping our rapport up, keeping our, our involvement up. Uh, but, you know, engaging in our role of trying to advise the system on, like, you know, what we think should be going on, but let the proletariat run the government as it but, is uh, okay you know, but party 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 what party we don't need a party we've got the convergence here we are right here and now we're doing it you know, without a party. Within the last couple of years that well my people definitely need a party well if we you know electoral politics okay there's the green party you know in the usa okay, i don't mean fine. for electoral politics i mean we but need a revolutionary party. organization that's yes, why i'm making a panther that's party what, that's what this is this is happening right here. This is the convergence forum. This is happening. I we will don't say, party. I don't think we need a party. Years. We need a federation of federations. You can't just skip. You can't just skip ahead of things without engaging with the process moving forward. Shit's not exactly linear. It's not like there's this step, this step, this step, this step, this step. That's a lot of fucking bollocks. But you can't right. just therefore then jump so far ahead that you get in a situation where the bourgeoisie could. Do what they do to anarchists when anarchists start setting up their like independent communes crap. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, like yeah. We do I need a federation of nations. Lenin talks about its importance of being the like the actual need moving forward. That a federation of all peoples is going to be the future. Yeah. But like while imperialism exists, we have to engage in that in a way where we're very careful that we don't create instability uh, for, for smaller countries where they could get into a federation and then what that big country, it's you know still going for its socialist development. It turns imperialist, it, it goes bad, revisionists take over, uh, US infiltration or, or all sorts of shit goes wrong. And then you have a massive country that turns bad. Y'all are all fucked. Like, but if you're have some semblance of like not like actual independence where you're Countries able too. to organize and direct yourself properly uh -huh. but then be in an alliance and in a cooperation uh -huh. that then uh -huh. creates the the situation where eventually we can build that world where the true federation of all nations is is feasible um so it's like building yes. like a, a cooperative federative relationship where it's not actually governmental it's more like um I guess kind of like the way that the UN works would probably be that, but like actual, like the, uh, not the way it works, but the way it, like the way it said the, the boilerplate, like the boilerplate of yeah, how it's meant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I'm, I, but I see the, the end of countries, you know, I don't, I don't equate countries with nations. First of all, like the UN, you know, has 194 nation states, you know, enrolled, you know, registered, you know, but there's 3000 nations in the world. You know, nations and, yeah, and yeah, countries nations are states, are you know, it's different things, you know. So UN is based upon the nation state, which I think is the fault that we have to overcome. So that means we have to overcome the United Nations, new and general assembly. There has to be a federation of federations of various nations. Uh, and in, in uh, Jewish Bundes terminology, that's national cultural autonomy, irrespective the of problem frontiers. Is, is there are countries that need to have like uh, an ascendancy to take control over their land so they're kind of in a situation where they need to ensure that they have uh, a complete right to that and there's nothing wrong with that in this situation that's a norm to society you know if you're treating with the bourgeoisie who kind of rely on people needing to have strict control over what it what is and what isn't 
then they're in a situation where they need to define their own land because otherwise they'll just get trashed over by the bourgeoisie. It's kind of that That's where it situation. comes from, yeah, exactly. The national bourgeoisie, you know, is the one that creates the nation state because they want to have an economy that they can control, where they cannot be confiscated from, uh, expelled from. You know, that's what sovereignty means. It means, you know, private property. That's all it means. I will but, say that from a moderately relevant point of view that in Europe alone, there has been the rise of fascism, not only in Italy, France, and the UK, but there's been plenty of fascist riots in my own state capital of Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. yeah. The thing is, is that what, what we have is a situation where there are quite different forms of what one could call nationalism, but also the way the, the state is also envisioned as well. I mean, whilst national boundaries are at least to the point lowered so people can at least enter and go is the socialist policy. Um, and the idea is the, um, you know, inside a socialist country, it is a multicultural system. It's not supposed to be a nation state. The state mm -hmm. system is supposed to be an international proletarian state mm -hmm. in the sense that like its relationship to the proletariat might coordinate through the borders of what one could consider actually usually a collection of nations. You know, you really kind of see a socialist country that just has one nation and it. it's like fucking Russia, China, you slap the top of it. You can fit so many fucking nations inside of here. But, you know, um, uh, you, you, there was 18 republics, if I remember rightly, you might be getting I'm that wrong. Speaking mostly of ethno European or white nationalism. But then, but no, but there's the, um, I'm talking on the position of nation states, not on the issue of um, white nationalism. So it's like, F, nation states tend to be like a bit of a step forward today because if not, you kind of get trampled over. And so it's like, it's one of those situations where it's not necessarily a step forward because, oh, you should have to go through specifically this form of national, we'll call it national ascendancy, you know, turning into a like a, like a modern day nation. You're uh, like, the, because what, what was the birth of the nation state? It did come through like a lot of like um, national uprisings against Cath uh, uh, Catholic uh, colonialism in Europe. So there is like uh, a thing to the whole libertarian, the, the the left, what it like originally means and what that kind of echoes. And so it's one of those kind of things where um, there is definitely some progressivity to it, but it's a limitation to us now. We need to get past the point of this, but there is a poignation in national liberation needing to formulate some form of nation state as a stepping stone of marking their ground of saying, yo, we have liberated this, get the fuck out. But then they need to be careful of the national bourgeoisie because if it's communists are engaging in this shit, they're dead meat. If they don't be careful of that fucking national bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie, they'll kill them and sign a deal with whoever the fuck they're struggling against that they ain't careful. So... Like, that's a struggle that a lot of us have to really consider. And the Irish one is one you can see that situation occur a lot. I mean, it was the fucking, uh, there was uh, the Irish volunteers. They uh, betrayed the Irish Revolution. They were a bunch of petty bourgeois uh, yeah. Irishmen. Uh -huh. You know, a British boss is a bastard and an Irish one's even worse. I fucking live by that. This is a really important discussion about nationalism that you brought up. You mentioned... Uh... Uh, this previously in another video. And uh, actually, it's a subject that I came into that I ran up against, you know, when I was doing my doctoral thesis, because uh, initially, you know, like I had the idea that there was a left nationalism and a right wing nationalism. And I thought that this is, you know, what was reflected in the uh, Zionist movement as well, because in the 20s uh, and 30s, you know, the Zionist movement was composed of both the, the those who were in favor of uh, building a state and those who were in favor of building a binational society in which they they thought they they called themselves you know cultural Zionists or or whatever you know but all well, of them were, including Einstein you know they cultural quit Zionist the Zionist sounds movement. like something Goebbels come up with yeah so you know after after forty five you know uh, Einstein and the others you know who were into this you know binational 
Zionist movement, you know, finally realized that they were being manipulated and they quit. They quit the Zionist movement because they were, you know, the Zionist movement was based upon nationalism per se as a bourgeois movement. And it was the national and the, and the Zionists, you know, formed a popular front, you know, in which they based upon Jewish identity. And, and this Jewish nationalism was basically, you know, state building, you know, nation building process that the uh, nation staters, you know, at the in uh, uh, at the uh, 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 centered in London, actually, you know, the, they have a whole theory, you know, of nation building there. And I went to one of their conferences, you know, and I spoke out, you know, but I didn't get too far. But anyway, you know, so I was always doing my thesis, you know, I realized, you know, that the difference between left nationalism and right nationalism doesn't exist, you know, because, you know, left nationalism is just, you know, a pseudonym for right nationalism. It's the same bag, you know, and the left nationalists eventually get, you know, like outmaneuvered, you know, and 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 uh, and expelled or purged or killed or 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 what or quit, you know. But and so nationalism per se, you know, it seems to me, you know, to be the ideology of a nation state, and it was formed by consciously formed as such, you know, by Hegel in 1648 in the Westphalia Agreement, which formed the German nation state, and it was composed of, you know, various. Uh, the Germanic provinces that uh, as a unif unification, you know, as a, as a criteria of unity was based upon Christianity. And so the nation state there was based upon a definition of nationality as being German by the criteria of, of Christianity. And that's how, you know, nation state was formed. And that is part of the ideology of nationalism. And I see that everywhere, including in the United States of America, where they added on in God we trust, and they and they know what God they mean. You know, they don't mean you know the the the, the original God. They mean the God that they have created for themselves. And even Trump, in his last speech, you know, spoke about one. You know, any in his first speech, you know, after the assassination attempt, he spoke about one nation and one faith, but he didn't pronounce the word faith. You know, very distinctly. And one faith means you know what it means. So this is what nationalism is all about. And so I turned against nationalism in my thesis, and I turned against the state as a categorical imperative, not just as a transitional program, but I as an okay. as an uh, imperative, you know, that you have to begin with and not end with. There is a type of nationalism that's missing from that, which is national liberation struggle, which is itself a form of nationalism. Yes, but that's not nationalism. Well, it, yes. it, nationalism means an ideology about like semantic a nation's like culture and like it's about like all that other sort of stuff. So like trying to take control of your own thing that technically would be a form of nationalism. It's just like it's distinctly called national liberation struggle because like what you would typically call nationalism le left or right ends up just being like social democrat or fascist positions a lot of the fucking time so what you end up getting is this recycled and regurgitated getting fucked around by two different but similar sides of the same coin yes uh, in china in the china context you know there was a national liberation movement that was led by mao that was essentially what Lenin called workers and peasants, you know, a government, a workers and peasants alliance, the United Front of the workers and peasants classes. But before that, the Communist Party was following a nationalism of China in which they were in a popular front with the national bourgeoisie, which was an, an ally and an agent of the Japanese occupation in contradiction with national independence, of course. But well, they, once it, they, they did they, both. They they were both opposing. So like the, the nationalists were weird. They were opposing the Japanese, then also working with them, then also opposing them. And they had massive splits because of it. There was the left faction yeah. that was yeah. like really supportive of the communists. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were they were sludgy in other ways. I mean, they weren't perfect. I think some people romanticized the left Kuomintang, but uh, like... <laughs> Left Kuomintang. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they were the left of the Kuomintang, the Communist Party was, until they got uh, decimated. No, no, I mean, I mean, like, 1936. No, no, I mean, after the Communist Party split, there was the left wing of the Kuomintang that was like co uh, more collaborative with the Communist Party. Oh, could be, yeah. But that's a secondary. Yeah, because the, the Communist Party of China split from like any of that sort of they were they were their own independent thing from yes. the 20s 1921 or something like yes. that's why i consider 1949 to be a socialist revolution but many people criticize china and saying that they never had a socialist revolution 
and that it's not socialist. They, okay, they it's not did, socialist. They, I agree they, with they... you there. But nonetheless, the revolution, you know, is a significant break. From well, they did have a, even though they, they nurture did, capitalism at the same they, time, but it's subordinate, did, you know, to the socialist revolution still. They did have a revolution, and they they kind of didn't form a proper dictatorship of the proletariat. Unfortunately, though, I mean, they tried to with the Cultural Revolution to change that problem, but basically, they allowed like bourgeois people into like official positions. Yeah. So they kind of they they. Uh, it's hard to say. Like they definitely tried to create a dictatorship with the proletariat firmly, but they created a situation that was like playing like whack a mole because they uh, uh, went for what's called new democracy, yeah. where the new the, the the up the uh, national bourgeoisie are considered collaborative with. So you work with them a bit, and it's like okay, there is maybe some point you could say about okay, our economy is not very well developed. We need to keep these guys under control. That would make some sense, you know, allow them to exist within a small minority and you shut them out when you don't need them anymore. But yeah. like collaboration to yeah. the point where they're holding positions of power. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like right. their, their, their knowledge and stuff can definitely be useful in a job that they can work on a fucking normal fucking pay rate, but they ain't getting to be a capitalist yeah. to fucking cooperate and like uh, have power over the system. But that yeah. caused problems. And uh, Mao's faction in the party ended up playing whack a mole with this stuff. The, the flag China has today, Mao hated that flag. He, 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 the, his flat, he, uh, I can't remember if he submitted one himself, but I, uh, no, he chose one that he preferred. I can't remember which one it was. Oh, okay, okay. But I think but that the reason is stuff that like that's like well. class collaborative is the problem. Ah, yes, it is. Um, uh, I think that what you're talking about, you know, applies to the uh, Russian Revolution as well and their policy of the NEP, the new economic policy, when they allowed, you know, a certain sort of, you know, like private development, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, land uh, ownership, you know, by the Kulaks. But Stalin came down and stopped that process from degenerating any further. I credit Stalin with having done so, actually. He came down, they came down a bit fucking heavy because they, they didn't deal yeah. with it properly sooner. Yeah, that's right. Uh, oh, He's and they were for all the they background were for, um, noise. What's that they, again? i sorry for all the background noise, but I think I'm eating some of my dinner from last night. I mean, okay, you that's can, okay, but there's no noise. Can, Don't worry about it. What's okay. it? Um, what was what was what was this? What was we saying? The NEP. Um, he came down hard on the NEP too hard because he. Oh wait, he came, too long, So right? so in the situation with the peasants, um, it was. I mean, they came down hard because I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. They were taken a bit off guard because. There was some weird shit going on with the Ukrainian Soviet. Like uh -huh. they reported that they had uh, enough grain um, when it came to the presidium. Uh, you know that report coming from uh, it was it was either someone associated with or directly from Nikita Khrushchev, mm -hmm. uh, and then Nikita Khrushchev telegrams Stalin. I guess like two weeks later, mm -hmm. uh, going on about how there's a state of emergency, there isn't enough food in Ukraine, there's been a massive famine, and we haven't managed to grow much grain at all. Mm -hmm. And Stalin's like, I, you said you had like enough grain to be able to send it like literally two weeks ago. How is this now all of a sudden new information? Yeah. Because like, yeah. how the fuck did you not know about a famine until yeah. like, like, what if you've got actually trimmed crops what's that it's got to be like at least a month after you fucking like would have gone for all your fields and noticed that there's a lot less harvest you know and with a famine you kind of notice it with all the fucking death and torment going on so there was some and, sabotage and cannibalism and as well yeah. yeah incredible incredible famine but if that if we apply that to china kara would you conclude that the uh, the opening to the uh, the bourgeois path of capitalist development in China has gone too far and it cannot be replaced and is going to eventually take over the state and take power away it, from the workers and peasants or do you think it can be reversed? It and took over price? the state. It took over the state with the military in nineteen seventy six. 
Uh -huh. um, there was a coup, uh, kind of similar to the Soviet coup in 1956. Uh, sixes are, just seem to be like bad times for people. Uh, but the, what's it? It'll scare the Christians if you use three of them. But the fucking, um, I, I feel like they are in a situation where not only do they need another revolution, but they're going to get one. Um, the there's been some Maoists in China that have started to emerge, as well as Marxist Leninists that, and, and even anarchists that are like you know fucking sick of China's shit. So, I mean, one of the hopes, uh, you know, on behalf of like the UPM would be to like fucking get to speak with some of these people. Uh, who are like struggling in China and get their voices out on like what the beat is on the street from China because we know these factories are really oppressive. So getting to speak to some of these workers that are struggling in them to get the actual like beat drop on them, especially some of the veteran workers who have worked in them for a long time. So they can tell you how much worse they used to be as well. Because this is like the modern version of those factories in Victorian Britain, where Victoria where Victorian Britain was selling out uh, the labor of the country for cheap to make as much capital as they could so they could like, invest it into finance capital and dominate the world. It's uh Lenin called it the principle of uh workshops of uh mm -hmm. workshop of the world or mm -hmm. the policy, sorry, not principle. Mm -hmm. Well uh okay well, China is become an imperialist power because of this. This you know, the private corporations are moving out, you know, they're using their uh advantages, you know, of a of a cheap labor pool that's subsidized the only... by the state. And they're the only company uh, mass capital to invest, you know, in China and internationally. The only companies that can go outside of the country have to be involved with the Communist Party, though. Mm -hmm. That's China's rules. So it's and that's always the dodgy thing. You can't trust the Communist Party that has billionaires in it. Like, yeah. uh, fuck. Like, I, I don't even know how you get to that point. Like, even if you're trying to lie to people, you would think you would just get the specific, like, political strata of the, like, bourgeois and petty bourgeoisie to handle government and kind of keep you capitalists in the back of the shed. Nah, nah. You know, uh, Xi Jinping is someone who owns, uh, like, private property. He's a landlord. Oh, uh, he comes from a rich family. Although he mm. did undergo a... Uh... Educational the... process. Okay, fine. <laughs> a trip Social to the summer games. camp. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, but but China. Uh, I mean, you know, there's 12 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. There surely must be factions in there with whom we could, you know, communicate. And so we asked, you know, people to share to this video and send it to especially Chinese, you know, sources. We have to get into China and we have to be able to speak out, you know, to the Chinese, you know, revolutionaries that we need, you know, an international collaboration. It's not enough, you know, to take care of your own country. You know, in fact, you know, the only way to actually take care of your own country is by doing so internationally with the Federation of Federations. You know where that comes from, that expression? Federation of Federations? It's not me who invented that. That's Proudhon. Proudhon. Oh, Proudhon. Proudhon. Yeah. But he'd never elaborated the, the, on it. He didn't know what it meant, you know, like he just said it, you know, like, okay, maybe he had some sort of. I forgot concept. who you said originally, my bad. <laughs> What's, uh, he's a fucking interesting guy. Yeah. Oh, I thought he said Putin at first. I was going to get Proudhon. <laughs> no, pulled on is the fucking uh, French anarchist. Uh, Marx took the piss out of him a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, what was it like? Yeah. Marx said that like uh, Proudhon and his wish for the end of nations is coming over <laughs> to England and expecting the English to listen to him talk in French. You know, <laughs> so much for a person who wants the end of nations. You would think he would speak in an international speaker, at least the language <laughs> the English could understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he, I think he called him like a typical Frenchman. <laughs> oh, 
hard to say yeah. his ideas of us forming federative organized like society is necessarily a bad idea. I just think his way to it is um, anarchistic, <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> like, not in the cool way. He's not an ANCOM like you would want him to be, but he definitely has the seedlings of someone who thinks like that. And uh, his books are uh, pretty good things for introducing people. I mean, you want to get into like an easy way to introduce someone to like socialism, even if you want them to be a Marxist. Get them conquest of the bread. That book is like a poetic way to introduce but someone to really because if you're talking about workers and lump and proles, we got experiences. Give us the poem, give us the poetry that the anarchists write, because that shit will go in our brain. And then when we start reading Lenin and fucking all that sort of shit, our brain will fizz really well and we'll be already interested because we read that beautiful poetry from uh uh Credon. If I can uh, be honest, like Albert. Albert who Camus Can had who? the best existential writing. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah. Oh my. Well, yeah, there was a lot of antagonism between the German socialists and the French, you know, like Lessing was the, the target of many um, a barb as well, even though I think he married one of Marx's daughters or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I mean, like, there's some crazy stuff as well with like what the socialism erupted into. Like that's like that happened like uh what was it the eighteen forty eight revolution? So the socialists mm -hmm. uh, had a conflict, and I don't just mean one conflict. So they had the conflict with the bourgeoisie. They tried to take over the revolution. Um, Lenin wasn't the first one to try and like turn up. Uh, a bourgeois revolution into a socialist one. Marx actually tried it himself too. Um, this was even before he corrected his shit with the Paris Commune. So it might have ended up being a train wreck because the Paris Commune really was when Marx kind of got his fucking software update. Um, yeah. <laughs> he still cooked on a lot of things before then, but his position on the state was a bit wonky. Um, what's it? Uh, what they were also fighting against was other socialists. Not your uh what, what was it they come from the critical utopian socialists so not your critical utopians not your scientific socialists which is what we are uh and not the you know the social democrats well they were fighting against us but you know shits but um the, they were kind the, of classical the right wing socialist methodology empiricists in terms and of so methodology Marx, that was the problem with the social democrats yeah. And so Marx's documentation of the manifesto of the, what was it? It was like the, the fucking, what was it, like the League of Communist Gentlemen, I think, at first. And then they called it the Communist Manifesto and they really published the book. But one of the things that was like put into the Communist Manifesto and it was turned into the big pamphlet that they, they release. Um, actually, pamphlet is kind of a bit of a small word for a 50 page book, but uh, was. Um, they uh, put a chapter in called Reactionary Forms of Socialism. So, and it has uh, like petty bourgeois socialism, feudal socialism, uh, bourgeois socialism, uh, German true socialism, or, or, or just called German socialism, and other things like that. And they're all these like uh, reactionary differentiations of socialism. Um, the one on the petty bourgeoisie actually has an interesting point at the end where like Marx goes on about how they've got very progressive positions. You know, they talk about the plight of the proletariat, the disintegration of the petty bourgeoisie, the breaking down of old moral bonds, the destruction of old nations, you know, the, 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 the terror of modern machinery, et cetera, et cetera. But like, their aims are ultimately centered around their, their own fleeting petty bourgeois interests as a, as a dying class where they're grasping on the hope of power mm. and they they'll create a system where they'll shove the old economic system inside new economic <laughs> foundations or they will literally just go for old shit from the past and uh the last statement he says is um when all things have faded and the truth comes to light this form of socialism dies in a miserable fit of the blues. Hmm. Wow. You know, uh, an interesting aspect of the Communist Manifesto, which is not considered usually, is that it was written for the first international, 
not the second mm -hmm. international. Now, the first international was composed of not only Marxists, but also anarchists. Yes. They were all in there together. <laughs> the way international should be, like, like yes. excluding anarchists from the international, like, so long as they pass the requirements to be about the international, because there definitely has to be requirements. You can't just fucking, like, everyone just join. Um, you've got to be like pretty strict on people actually yeah, applying be, to certain yeah, positions. Working working class or movement, yeah. You know, it can't be you know it can't be you know like petty bourgeois or bourgeois you know facsimile, yeah. But it, that communist manifesto was written on behalf of the anarchists as well. So the communist manifesto, yes. you know, uh, can actually be called the communist and anarchist manifesto. Well, I see because like principled anarchists yeah. as communists as why well. like i see yeah. ancom as like the best formation of anarchism that we've ever seen like yeah. and they love reading marxism so they're quite like a lot of those old anarchists where we used to exchange and interchange ideas we disagree on some things but we have a shared canon of knowledge and we interface with that sort of stuff and like most ancoms i know uh, like they spin circles around some revisionists that are, like mm -hmm. go on, like talk all this talk about how much they've read. And then these anarchists who have their own literature to also focus on are just schooling the shit out of them on Marxism. And I'm just like, I don't need to do anything. I'm just going to watch. I'm going <laughs> to enjoy. But I would uh, point out that the best anarchist of all is Rudolf Rocker, because he's the one who understood what national identity was. Even though he didn't support nationalism, and that's What's why I get a lot name? of my, you know, talk about the difference between national identity and nationalism. Yeah, Andrew. What's his name again? I'll look him up. Rudolf Rocker. Rudolf Rocker. Yeah, like Rudolf the Red Nosed Reindeer. Yeah. yeah. How's the Rocker is like a baby Rocker. Yeah. What's it? Um. Okay, she's not the best. She definitely has her faults, but she's my favorite and uh, uh, anarchist, and that would be Emma Goldman. Maybe oh, yeah. a bit of a milk toast choice, but she's a very interesting person. She's got some positions I definitely don't agree with, but she's otherwise a really, really fucking interesting writer. Like, don't find many people that write like quite like she does. Yeah. And uh, her take of someone who, like, as much as there's definitely something she says about the USSR that's questionable, her experiences that she talks about from when she was there, that shit definitely is interesting to me because there are a lot of inherent problems that existed. And even though the USSR tried to incorporate <laughs> Jewish people into society, probably better than any state ever did ever at this point in time, uh, th there was not a good enough cultural radical movement because there was no formal cultural revolution to actually formalize those changes and make Jewish people feel comfortable. So it mm -hmm. didn't change the, the general feel texture of like community yeah. society. And so Jewish people yeah. still felt really uncomfortable, even if society yeah. was otherwise willing to protect them and crack heads if anyone started on them. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Emma Goldman was deported. She was uh, deported, and uh, one reason she was deported was because she was Jewish. And the two who were uh, executed for uh, espionage, you know, in, in uh, transferring a nuclear bomb information supposedly to the Soviet Union, they were also Jewish. They were executed, you know, because they were Jewish. They were sacrificed, even though they weren't directly responsible for the uh, information transfer in the first place, the Rosenbergs. So, oh, yeah. you know, the position of the Jewish people in the United States, seemingly secure, is very fragile when it comes down to it. Yeah, I, it's a, a blink like that. You know, you, you look at like the, 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 the drastic difference between the USSR and the United States on like the livelihood of Jewish people is yeah. Im immense. Yeah. Like, the, and what's it? Jewish people still have a quandary with rights in Europe. I mean, think about the EDL. What's their alliance or, or the IDL to uh, mm. it, Israeli Defense League, Inbred Defense League? Who knows? You guess. Uh, insert what you want. Uh, but the, you know, their ties with Israel is because of this fucking rapture shit. I guarantee you, because they want to <laughs> kick all the Jews out. 
So they're working with Israel to attack the Muslims. You know, you help us attack the Arabs. Mm -hmm. So you're going to target Muslims generally because then you can use racial confusion to trip people up. And then what you then do is then they can send all the Jews from Europe into um, uh, Palestine, into uh, the occupied territories, and form all these new settlements and yeah. genocide Jewish people from Europe. Jewish people yeah. have a right to fucking yeah. Europe. They're like, they've been a very big part of their like fucking history. And for most of it, they've been abused. So like important part of Europe. Mm. There are two things I'd like to say. Yeah. So come First, closer to the microphone. You have to sit up straight and, and speak into the mic. Sorry. First of all, about my favorite anarchist. His name is Nestor Makhno of oh, the Ukraine yeah. Free Territory. Yeah. yeah. I don't like him. Oh, the Black Army. I mean, they yeah. did slaughter yeah. communists and the communists slaughtered them as well, but they were the ones who granted national cultural autonomy for the Jewish people in Odessa. What my problem is was the chain ganging. That's what I don't like. It was reported by the Soviets that he was chain ganging peasants, and there was like fuck it. I think there was some images. I'm not sure, but there was there was chain gangs, and I'm like, yo, no matter what those people done, you don't chain gang people. Chain ganging people is just fucking inhumane. Oh, like, that's what my country does. I never knew that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The US yeah. Has, uh, millions of uh, slaves in prison now working for nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see it all the time going down my road. Wow. What do you see? Well, you're in the part of country where they, they do things a lot differently than some other prisons. Like, shit is like rotted, like, Fucking the old school shell when you're in there, shell around the city region. Uh, so prisons are like those kind of places where they look more like death camps. Like oh, prisons yeah. are already basically just fucking camps, but these like prisons, uh, like there's your quarters and there's like the camp and workspace. You grind like a slave, you do very useless work compared to some of the places in a lot of these prisons. Not all of them. Some of them you are doing work for some good profits, but some of them they'll just have you like banging rocks all day for no good fucking reason if they if they feel like it. Here like, in rural Tennessee, there, Andrew. if you're good here in rural Tennessee, they'll have you working on those camps. What do you see, Andrew? How? Uh, what? What kind of work are they doing? How are they I've dressed? Been out, I've been out to the uh, so-called Bledsoe County penitentiary and only the good penitentiary inmates are allowed to work outside and the best of the best are allowed to work on roads uh -huh. so they do repair yeah. road work and stuff like that yeah uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. out in the scorching sun with like barely any water California uses inmates to fight fires uh -huh. um, what's uh um, in uh, Pennsylvania, in uh, Philadelphia, uh, the the penitentiary near there is responsible for Zippo lighters. You ever had a Zippo, the petrol uh -huh. lighter? Uh -huh. Yeah, every yeah. single one of them comes out of a prison, whether it's one that's made in England or one that's made in the USA. I don't know if Canada's like this, but that, that's how it is everywhere else. Uh, actually, most of the ones you get in the UK come from America nowadays. I don't think they make them in our prisons anymore, but uh, we used to make them here too. Uh -huh. uh, it's a common experience. Like you speak to someone who's been to prison in Philly, and they, they, there's a good chance they've made some lighters. Um, have you heard that the uh, prisoners in Ukraine have been released into the military? They've been all the criminals who have been uh, convicted of you know civil crimes. Uh, are uh, given their freedom if they agree to go into the military and fight for the Ukraine. Have you heard this as well? Some of them have been allowed into the Azov Battalion. Yeah. Oh, fuck, you know. I mean, releasing prisoners to fight in a war, if you are in a situation where you're getting your, like ass kicked, is not necessarily a bad idea. But 
you know that like a lot of these fucking people are like gonna end up being egged into a direction that is probably not so rehabilitative because uh, you never can put the complete doubt behind you know there are going to be many people that are going to actually take it as an opportunity to get the fuck out like oh i fight this i become a hero of my country i get to you know go home have my family back or like make a family and actually get to live a life but there's going to be opportunists and those people will be taken advantage of by the the zionist the zionist fucking hell by the by, by the nazis they're all the same thing uh by the by the nazis in ukraine with the azov battalion and push towards uh sort of greater depths of of fucking the madness of this fucking war fascism versus fascism fucking bonkers okay this is all good all good material you know that doesn't get said anywhere else and i'm glad that we're getting this out okay so i'm going to uh, upload this and then uh, send you out the links and then we have to get this uh, around the world especially into china that's what we're missing you know like china is not connected you know in terms of the revolutionary struggle not Are there any people? even with russia you know we're not connected yeah. Yep. Anyway, okay. But uh, this has been a good day. So looking forward to uh, our discussion again next week. And I'm going to conclude now and invite you to uh, make any uh, concluding remarks. And then we will stop recording and we'll put this out. Go. I will um, say that. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go say what you want to say first. I'll say what I said after. I will say that even though, well, what worries me the most is the fact that Ukraine has attacked first within Russia. Yes, go on. And, uh, what if Russia eventually uses nuclear or at least chemical weapons, you know? That, that'll call in NATO. Well, well it's the danger is that the Ukraine will use uh, chemical weapons uh, and uh, depleted uranium as well. Uh, oh, most Russia definitely. Is, yeah, but uh, Russia has declared that it's uh, not intending to uh, occupy the Ukraine, that they are uh, their intentions are delimited by the Donbass region and by the uh, republics that have defined themselves as Russian rather That's than Ukrainian. Know. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but I'm worried about what the uh, Ukrainian military mentality will be when, or in the face of uh, I know the NATO massive losses. Ukraine depleted uranium about a year ago and that's another thing that concerns me. Like, what if they try attacking Russian like uh, atomic power plants, you know? Yeah, they could be attacking the... They are attacking the nuclear plant there. Really? Yeah, yeah. It, oh there was already a fire God. that started there. There was black smoke coming out of it. Yeah, it could um, be disastrous. There's also talk about a dirty bomb that Ukraine would use on... A on dirty the bomb? Yeah, you know, radioactive follow-up type bomb. Yeah, yeah. The... dirty bomb refers to a... a, a, a one stage or well sorry two stage nuclear bomb so um no no it's one stage yeah so it's just a gun it, or an impact and it like it fires at the nuclear fissile material it goes through uh, uh fission and it creates a lot of dirty radioactive cloud while well, fusion is known as a clean bomb because no, uh, hydrogen no, bombs no, uh... Uh, no, it, it doesn't go into fission. It just vaporizes. So the radio, radioactive particles are no. It does. It, it does go into fission. It's a fission bomb. I, I'm on about it. it's explosion. It's a fission well, bomb. Well, what they um, call a dirty bomb is is, is not a fission it, or a fusion yeah, bomb. It's a, it's just a vaporization of the bomb by, by ordinary. Well, no, I mean, I mean, like in nuclear bomb terms, like if a, a dirty bomb is a type one nuke and a clean bomb is a type two nuke. So a dirty bomb is what oh, you yeah. would call the a missile nuclear weapon. Yeah. And then 
and well, no, it's that it's that it's just it's a fissile nuclear bomb, so it makes a big cloud of radiation. While a while a hydrogen bomb doesn't. Hydrogen bombs are very clean because uh, the fusion vaporizes most of the materials. While with fis fu with uh, fission bombs, they don't vaporize most of the stuff. Fission causes a lot of dirty fucking radioactive metals to be thrown around everywhere. And there was another type of dirty bomb that's never been made but has been theorized. And that is to stick, um, oh, what's that metal? It's really fucking heavy. I can't think of it. Um, is it helium too? No, no, no. It's one that when it fucking gets like hit by a nuke, it turns into like a fucking nasty fallout device. Um, so cobalt. Cobalt. So they would stick cobalt in it. Cobalt has like a fucking ridiculously high half, 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 uh, half life. So it takes ages yeah. to lose its radioactivity uh -huh. and so they would strap it in there and what would happen uh -huh. is the nuke would air burst and then hot molten cobalt that's radioactive molten will rain from the sky over uh -huh. everything for days and oh. so everyone will get cobalt poisoning which will kill you in moments like the radioactive poisoning from cobalt is intensely high but what has already begun in those terms is the attack on the uh, nuclear, uh, the largest European nuclear reactor is being attacked. And it was already, you know, part was, you know, burning when I saw the video last, black smoke coming out of the uh, of the um, uh, cooling chambers. I don't so know if this is correct. That's possible. But... You know, that's going, there's going to be, you know, escalation, you know, there. Uh, around the Ukraine, and uh, and uh, this week there's going to be an escalation around the uh, 11th. There's going to be a retaliation from Iran, Hezbollah, and, and Nasser. So, um, you know, that's what we can uh, face, and that's what we uh, expect to happen, and then uh, we can uh, take it up, you know, in discussion next week. Yeah, Karen. I will say that, you know, people need to really be trying their best to get in contact with as much people as possible and get built up into organizing. Obviously, there's a lot of people that have struggles that they might not be able to overcome on their own, and we need like better institutions for struggle to help those people get out there. People shouldn't kick themselves down if they are in that situation. But we need to be doing, you know, those who can need to be trying their best to do, and like we need to get out there, get connected, and try and look at what already exists as well as what we need to build and like start marching forward from there mm. um and co cooperate you know we need to cooperate and collaborate with other left groups even the ones that we don't actually agree with like mm. uh, fundamentally but we have like some specific things that we can fight on for now like with the social democrats and other groups like that and fighting against fascism and just trying like build up a rapport of struggle a point of engagement you know be a be an actual like marxist about it in the case of marxists speaking out there same with anarchists actually you know speak virulently speak clear speak about the problems going on in society and attack the heart of the issue on the streets active and involved and keeping your face present and known to the people. Yeah, yeah. But building organization, we need to build organization is the key to all of this. Action. Yeah. My phone yeah. just died. We have but to Palestine, the problem. Yeah. The Palestine struggle is like far from over and like the protests need to be getting bigger, not smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the, uh, it's the movement that has to take care of us protecting the Palestinians. Nobody else. Is I will it. say that, uh, one second. Yeah. No, we can't hear you anymore. Okay, that's uh, we should be ending this in any case. So uh, let's uh, put an end to uh, this uh, transmission and we'll continue next week when we see what the results of our projections are going to be. So hold on. And sorry, my phone died. Away we go. Sorry, my okay. phone died. I mean, yeah.